to walk in the light of His love. Teach me to pray to my Father above. Teach me to know all the things that are right. Teach me, teach me to walk in the Child and together we will of his commandments that we may return home to his presence to live in his sight. For loving guidance to show us the way, a great family praise thee with songs of delight. Gladly, gladly, we'll walk in the light. Teach me to walk in the Hello, and welcome to this week's Walk in the Light devotional. My name is Elder Sims. And my name is Elder Garner, and we will be this week's hosts. We're ecstatic to be here with you today. As we get the event started and people join in, let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from. Voices. We hear a lot of them living in today's world. Some good, some bad, and a lot of them saying different things. We can find ourselves lost in the chaos of everything, maybe even lose the sound of our own voice. For that reason, we wanted to flood social media with inspiring and uplifting messages in hopes that all could find a light in this changing world, the light of Jesus Christ. Today, we are joined by Anthony Sweat and are excited to hear how he walks in the light of Jesus Christ. We will now hear a musical number from Sister Barlow and Sister Saya, who are currently missionaries serving in the Massachusetts Boston Mission. Afterwards, Sister Lott, who is also a missionary serving in the Massachusetts Boston Mission, will say the opening prayer. You're not your mistake. Thank you. 
That was beautiful. Thank you so much, sisters. Like we said before, today we are joined with the audience captivating painter, author, and public speaker, Anthony Sweat, Associate Professor of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. Dr. Sweat received his bachelor's degree in painting and drawing and his PhD in curriculum and instruction. As a practicing artist, his paintings center on previously undepicted important aspects of religious history to promote visual learning. Having an extensive background in religious education as well, he's the author of many faith-infused books that have held many strength in their relationship with God. To say the least, we're excited to hear him. Brother Sweat, the time is yours. Thank you so much, elders and sisters. Thank you for that beautiful musical number. Uh, that was really cool, and uh, I appreciate the prayer also. I hope that the Spirit can be with me to guide me in uh, a little message I want to share with you about um, uh, a thought about Christ, um, and then I'm going to use a little bit of my art to emphasize that message. I want to say up front that I have no idea what Jesus looks like. Um, uh, and unless you've seen him, you likely don't either. Some of the ways that we paint Jesus uh, are a lot of based on in history. Uh, you know, he's been painted a certain way with hair parted down the middle and a beard and high cheekbones for 1,500 years. But there's also power in painting Jesus in his own ethnic uh, um as a Jew, as a you know, Judean Roman at the time, there's also power in painting Jesus in our various cultures so that we are, see ourselves in him. Um, I think it's really cool when I see black Jesus, for example. I love that. It's really cool when I see an Asian Jesus, um, a Latino Jesus. We need to see ourselves in our art. And what I'm going to share with you today is seeing ourselves in Christ and some of my paintings just that I've done exploring uh, him and his look uh, as I try to express not necessarily what Jesus looks like. What I want to invite you to do up front is let go of what Jesus looks like 
and let art do what art does best and transform you into uh, being in awe of Jesus or thinking what it would be like to be in his presence in some way or to behold his face in some way, okay? So as we do that, I'm going to share a little bit of the PowerPoint. If you could uh, bring that up, hopefully it's on there as well, uh, with uh, Walk in the Light. One of the first questions when we look at Christ and, and think about our relationship with him and walking with him is this. There's this idea that al although some people may know us, uh, we feel like sometimes nobody really understands us. There's a difference between that. There's, there's a handful of people that I would say know me very well, but do who really understands me and who really understands you? Uh, every day, wherever you're at, wherever you're tuning in on this broadcast, uh, you face challenges and trials and tests and temptations that no one else, not your spouse or a sibling or even your best friend, they can't perfectly relate to it because they're not literally in your shoes and in your mind and in your own heart. We can try to explain it to them and express it to them, but oftentimes we seem like we're, we're uh, on our own in some way. And that can be kind of disconcerting for people. But what I want to share with you as we learn to walk in the light of Christ is that one of the most powerful and comforting ideas centers on this idea that Jesus understands us. He identifies with us because he felt with us. And I want to talk a little bit about that with you. This is a little painting that I did called Man of Comfort. Sometimes with art, there's a beauty and abstraction, by the way, and not making things super detailed. Uh, in uh, Like in this, because then you don't get lost in you know, oh, is that was what his eyes look like, or his uh, you know skin color is like, or the bridge of his nose? Uh, these are some more abstracted, impressionistic paintings, and every one of them I called them man of something, and I called this the man of comfort because when I look at this, it it sent me uh, because of the colors and uh, just the expression and the pose that he's holding it. It sent me this idea of comfort. And one of the things that our Savior does is he knows how to comfort us in our different uh, situations because he has he knows our situation. That's what I want to talk about with you. So one of the things I want to talk about with you is Jesus being a mortal. Uh, we, we know that Jesus is divine. He's the Son of God. I believe that very, very deeply. One of the reasons why I love Jesus so deeply is because Jesus was also a person, a mortal, a human when he was on earth. Remember when we open up the book of John, it says the word became flesh. One way that you could translate that in Greek is that Jesus came and pitched his tent among us or that he became one of our fellow campers. Isn't that a great idea? Um, that, that Christ said, I'm going to come down and be in the midst of everybody else and not be a distant God, but he was going to be one with us. He came to labor right alongside of us. Think of getting down and doing a dirty job. And mortality is a dirty job sometimes. And, uh, you know, when people come out and aren't afraid to get their hands dirty and get in the mud with us, that's what Jesus did. And when he chose to become human and to come to mortality, he, like the rest of us, he put on mortal flesh. The word became flesh. That's unbelievable. By the way, it was that's so unbelievable that, some early people before Christ thought it was blasphemous to think that God would become mortal because they knew that if God became mortal or human, that he would undoubtedly get, as I wrote here, sore muscles and he'd get tired and sick and get blisters when he works and get cuts and bruises. And I want you to understand and see a Jesus like that. I don't know if anybody out there has been watching the show, The Chosen, I think it's their third episode. One of the reasons why that episode is so powerful is because it shows Jesus uh, with a sore back and having to stretch out. It shows him going to sleep and getting his pillow ready, and he became human. I mean, that's it's so cool to think of it that way. When he was born as a baby, remember, he was a baby. He had to learn how to crawl and to walk and run just like we all did. He had to learn how to talk. 
I mean, the word, the man who spoke and worlds were created. He had to learn how to speak again. He had to learn how to gain control of his body like we all do. Perhaps even he forgot things sometimes. Maybe he misplaced his father's tools when he was a kid and helping with construction. Maybe he lost track of time like we all do or had to be reminded of something. If, if I'm saying this and it makes you a little uncomfortable, think about when he was 12 and his family traveled uh, to Jerusalem. And then when his family left Jerusalem, he forgot to tell his parents that he wanted to stay uh, and didn't communicate with them, causing an unnecessary search for three days for a missing boy. So much so that his mother said that they saw him sorrowing. Um, Jesus had to learn things too as he went along. Although his mind was brilliant, he had to learn line upon line. Um, the very next verse, by the way, after Jesus, when his parents said that to him, the very next verse says that he became subject unto his parents. Like, okay, I gotta, gotta tell my mom and dad where I'm going, uh, even as I grow up. Uh, remember, he, Jesus wasn't born with a fullness of knowledge. Thus, he increased, as Luke 2.52 tells us, he increased mentally and physically, emotionally and spiritually, just like we all do. He became mortal like you and me in every sense of the word. These are powerful ideas. I love them. So this is a little painting I did called Man of Nazareth. You can tell here it's a little more expressionistic. I painted this whole thing with my palette knife. Um, it's maybe a little more historical Jesus. And Jesus was likely more olive-skinned. If we look at, uh, uh, at, at Jude uh, Judean during the time of the Roman um, period, he probably had dark hair, probably had darker eyes, um, maybe a little bit of facial hair. Uh, his hair was maybe uh, not so long and flowing as we give it. Sometimes we do that out of a sense of beauty for him. His hair was maybe a little longer and tousled. But I like this because to me, it, it, it sends this message of he became immortal. He came in the meridian of time and had to wear regular clothes and had to do regular work and got dirt on his face, um, just like we all do. He also understands temptation. He felt all the human emotions. I don't want anybody out there to think that Jesus was above emotion. Uh, just read the Gospel of Mark, and if you read the Gospel of Mark, you will see a Savior full of emotion. Sometimes he's angry. Sometimes he's sad. Sometimes he's frustrated. Sometimes he longs for things to happen. Sometimes he's humiliated or he's lonely. By the way, sometimes he wants to be alone. Sometimes he's like, I'm tired of these apostles who don't understand a word I'm saying. I need some time alone. Just give me some space. Or maybe we would say in 2020, I need some me time. But we also learned that Jesus experienced emotions like joy and happiness and excitement and contentment and, and all. He, he understands and felt our emotion. He didn't only experience mortality in all of its normalcy like we do, but I think the Savior also seemed to experience temptation and all of its difficulty. I don't want you to read um, uh, in Matthew when Jesus is tempted as as though that was the only time Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted his whole life, um, just like we are. Remember it said that when he finished those temptations in, the, in Matthew, that the devil departed from him for a season. Jesus had to learn and, and be faithful his whole life. Um, the apostle Paul says it this way, quote, for we have not a high priest, Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Um, Christ understands temptation because he felt it and knows how to reject it um, and never gave into it. He didn't hover above these mortal experiences. He was part of it in the midst of them. And this doesn't demean Jesus. To me, it deifies them. I'll explain why. Uh, this is another little painting that I did just called Man of Joy. I'm uh, just thinking of Christ smiling and having a sense of humor and, and uh, enjoying something, laughing. It's hard, by the way, to paint in reverent ways the Son of God smiling or laughing or 
I kind of like this one though, because you get a little you, with the yellow. The yellow helps that, but also a smile on his face as well. Well, I also want, you know, even though I show man of joy, we also know that he was a suffering savior. And speaking to the Latter day Saints out there, our Catholic friends do a good job remembering this. One of the areas I greatly admire Catholicism. When they put uh, Jesus on his crucifix and uh, they kneel before him and they weep before that, they remember his suffering. And if anything, Jesus wants us to remember he suffered. Um, every week when we partake of the sacrament, we're supposed to remember his sufferings and his death. Uh, he, he suffered things on our behalf too. Again, Paul, or the author of Hebrews, wherefore in all things it behooveth him to be made like unto us, brethren, that he might be a faithful high priest. This is a great little poem from a, a Christian minister called Jesus of the Scars. And before I read this, by the way, when you think in the context of like Roman and Greek gods, uh, you know, those, those, those gods were above everything. And the idea that, like, like, what kind of a God do you worship? Uh, somebody who gets sick and suffers and feels pain and gets sad and cries. That's a weak God is maybe how some Greek or Romans would look at it. But I love this poem. The other gods, meaning Roman, Greek, or ones like that. The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. This is a painting I did called Man of Sorrows. A little bit more impressionistic and abstracted and modern. But I painted this painting on top of this red and pink under layer. Then I painted the orange and the hint at Christ and a sad Christ on top of it. And then I took my uh, sander and just sanded away stuff and stripped off this half of him uh, to try to send that message of pain and suffering and loss and, and um, scrapes and bruises and, and the, the weight that that caused him that he did in our behalf. And not only did he suffer those things, uh, it extends beyond just mortal suffering and temptation. The scriptures teach us that Jesus descended below everything so that he could ascend above everything. In some way unfathomable to you and I, Christ understood the depths of human pain, human misery, um, human uh, difficulty, so much so that he suffered below everybody. Um, you know, to the depths of hell, if I could say it that way. This is what Elder Neil A. Maxwell, if you're not a Latter-day Saint, he's, he was one of our members of our Quorum of the Twelve Apostles uh, in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. Elder Maxwell said this, he called it the awful arithmetic of the atonement, that Jesus not only uh, suffered for the sins of humanity, but somehow also suffered the pains the sicknesses and infirmities of all mankind who ever lived or would yet live. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob said that Jesus would experience, quote, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children who belong to the family of Adam. A Book of Mormon prophet named Alma taught that Christ would take upon him the pains of his people and also the sicknesses and infirmities, which means the difficulties, the trials, let alone our sins. And, and be willing to die for our sin. Uh, this is a little painting I did uh, trying to think of that, of what he uh, descended below um, uh, for all of us, a little painting I titled called Man of Rejection, somebody who knows what it's like to be rejected as well. You can hopefully see that in his eyes. And maybe that's why Isaiah said that, quote, in all our afflictions, Jesus was afflicted. Somehow Jesus of Nazareth felt and suffered with Anthony Sweat from Utah. And he equally has suffered for and in behalf of each of God's children, past, present, and future. I don't pretend to comprehend that, by the way. But I have felt personally that Jesus understands me. 
and that uh, he knows me and that he has felt with me and suffered for me, uh, including uh, suffering for my sins so that I might overcome them. I'm so grateful for that. And if I know that he's done that for me, I know God loves you equally. Uh, he loves all of his children. So he's done that for you too. That's the testimony that's in me. It's a little painting I did called Jesus After Herod as he was getting ready to suffer and die on the cross for our sins. And uh, please don't ever think that um, uh, in Latter-day Saint belief, we believe that Jesus felt and suffered a lot of this in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, but he also suffered it on the cross and that he specifically tells us in scripture that he died on the cross so that we might be forgiven of sin. He was lifted up for our sins and gave his life for, for it as, as they laid that purple robe on him and mocked him in our behalf. Well, why? Why did Jesus do this? Why did he feel all this and experience his mortal life? Well, a little hymn that we like to see sing is called Jesus Savior, Pilot Me. And one of the lines says, Pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. And one of the reasons why I think this mortal aspect of Jesus deifies him, it doesn't demean him, it deifies him, is because Christ came and successfully sailed the oceans of, of life, the global waters of mortality. And because he has sailed those waters, he knows how to tell us how to chart the water successfully. Thus, none of us are ever completely on our own and nobody needs to go it alone. Nobody out there does. Well, each of us are in unique situations and sometimes we're misunderstood by others. Nobody can say to heaven, you don't understand because our savior does. He does understand, he does know. Paul says again, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. I like that word sucker. Sucker means to give aid or to run to or to help. The Book of Mormon uses that same word. He did this so that, quote, his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to sucker his people according to their infirmity. He's like the older sibling who's walked the path, who can then tell us how to walk it successfully ourselves. So this is a little painting I did called Man of Wisdom. Um, I love the oranges in that. And, and uh, just that look of, of confidence that we can have in him and of following his way. Uh, remember, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He's trying to get us to understand him and to follow him because he knows exactly what should be done. As I conclude, let me just end with these thoughts, and then we can have a little Q&A. Uh, because Jesus has successfully suffered and overcome all things, he can help us in our things. I want you to remember that line. Because he has suffered and overcome all things, he can help us in our things. His mortal condescension enables our eternal ascension. So the one direct application for everybody listening is to listen to the counsel that comes to us through the Lord's Spirit as we seek divine direction in our lives. Um, try to pay attention to that inner voice as you lift your voice to heaven, whether audibly or just in your heart, in your mind. As you try to be quiet and listen and be meek. Um, as this scripture says, learn of me. Listen to my words. Walk in the meekness of my spirit. And you shall have peace in me. It's almost like a formula. Learn, listen, walk, and you'll have peace. Um, whatever it is that we're facing today or tomorrow, we can confidently turn to Christ and say, how should I handle this? What should I do? How would you act? Um, or how would you have me to act? I say that sometimes, by the way, because... I'm not like Jesus in a lot of ways, and I struggle uh, and, and, and a flawed and mortal. So I like to say, how would you have me to act? Um, and this is one of the reasons why we need to study Christ's life and try to receive his spirit is because 
it's hard to know what Jesus, you know, WWJD, that, that old acronym, what would Jesus do? It's hard to know what Jesus would do if we don't know what Jesus did. And it's hard to know how Jesus would love if we don't have his spirit with us. Gotta, gotta seek that spirit and seek to connect with him. So that's just my invitation to you. One way you can walk in the light uh, is to uh, do that. I would invite everybody here to uh, lift, uh, lift your heart up to God in confidence that he understands you as you pray to your Father in heaven and then listen uh, to the whisperings that come through his Holy Spirit and the comfort that comes in knowing that his divine Son, who is your friend, uh, will guide you uh, as you go through your day-to-day -day life, when, wherever you're at, whatever situation you're in. I'm confident the Lord can strengthen and help and guide, comfort and assist you. And that's the testimony in me and one way that you can walk uh, in his light. And I'll leave that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, yes, Brother Sweat. We You're welcome. are very happy to have you here on Walk in the Light today. And uh, for your awesome message about Jesus Christ and truly how he is like all of us. He has suffered just like we have. And more importantly, he overcame all so that we can be here. Very, very important on that. Yeah. Yeah, I hope, I hope nobody misunderstood me when when I say he's mortal like us. He is, but he isn't in the sense that he didn't make the same mortal uh, sins and errors that you and I do. He he overcame them all. And that's a quote that you said that I loved. You're like Christ understands temptation because he felt it, and because he felt that, um, he knows how to resist it. So that's one way we can walk in his life. Yeah. We can have that assurity that. If we look at him, we can resist it because he understands exactly how we feel. Yeah, if you guys know who C.S. Lewis is, the great writer, Christian writer, C.S. Lewis said, uh, you don't understand the, the, the strength of the German, German army by lying down and giving into it. You understand it by fighting back or, uh, you know, you don't lay down when the wind blows. It's only by resisting it that you understand. He said there's, there's this false idea that good people don't know what sin is. And C.S. Lewis said, I would argue the only good people know what sin is because they're the only ones who've tried to resist it. <laughs> and that in that in that vein, Christ is really the only one who really understands sin and temptation because he never gave into it. He, he always resisted it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we have uh, some people that are filling the comments up with questions. So I guess we'll kind of switch to a little bit of a, a question answer portion. If that's all right with you. Awesome. Sweet. So this first question, uh, well, I guess it's kind of a two-in-one kind of question. Uh, the first one is, what qualities uh, make a great teacher, and how has Christ influenced your teaching style, your painting style? Uh, that's a great question. I think the number one quality of a great teacher is they are able to translate their message to their audience. They can, they can speak in a way that their audience understands. And whether you're talking to little kids, whether you're talking to older people, whether you're talking to educated people, whether you're talking to uneducated, whether you're talking in different cultures or a great teacher is always able to communicate and translate their message in a way that their hearers can grasp it. And Christ is a master at that. And that affects my own teaching. I talk, I, I speak and talk differently in different environments, or I try to. And it also affects my painting. I, I need to paint in a way that is accessible. If I paint in a way that people don't understand it, then my art has failed. So I believe that I need to paint in a way that makes it accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, Christ was the perfect example of that. You, as we see in the scriptures, he always knew his audience, and he was always able to bring themselves down and have the empathy to bring himself down to their level. And that's one thing that I love about Christ and his teachings. Yeah. Amen. Seeing some of your, your paintings, uh, there are some questions flowing in about the kind of preparation that goes into your paintings. Do you study for each painting before you paint it? Do you think about the audience that you're trying to reach? What kind of preparation goes into that? Yeah. Right. 
to your process? Well, the kind of prep I, I've, I've been trying to learn how to be a good painter for my whole life. So there's been a lifetime of preparation skill wise, but in terms of like, like what's going on in my mind and my heart, like a, a good painting has to come out of your soul. And on some of those paintings, I'm not referencing a model. I'm not looking at anything. I'm just kind of, those are a lot of those that I showed today are just little small, little five by seven. They're, they're only about the size of my hand, maybe. Wow. And I paint them in maybe a few hours. They're, they're a one sitting painting. And I just kind of, you know, have a, a thought of, in my mind of Christ or in of, of something about his character, his attributes that I'm trying to better grasp. And then I just see what comes out. That's awesome. Yeah. Would you say that you're kind of guided in your painting by, by the spirit. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm hesitant to say that. Uh, I hope I am. <laughs> uh, I hope I am, but, um, I don't know. I'm just trying to express using color and shapes and lines and forms and shadows and highlights. Just trying to express things that I feel about him. Mm -hmm. You do a great job with that in, yeah. in your paintings. You. Well, some of them are better than others. So not every painting is successful, but it's like life. That's part of it. You just got to keep working at it. Exactly. Yeah. And hopefully we get to the point where we can have, you know, one sitting paintings and have them look as good as, <laughs> as you do. Yeah. And so obviously you were talking about the names of some of your paintings, whether it be man of sorrows or man of joy. Uh, do you have a favorite title of Christ that you, that influences your life? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, you know, this little series of paintings I did is I've done those little different man of, I probably did, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them. Um, but the, the, the man of suffering one uh, really resonates with me um, and the man of joy because both of those, we don't, we don't want suffering. We want joy, uh, right? Uh, we, but I think that's one of the fundamental things that the scriptures teach us is that the only way that you know joy is to know pain. and you and I have to experience the difficulties of mortality to, to know what it's like to be redeemed. Those, those two paintings, I just like both of them because I'm grateful that my Savior shows me the path to joy. I'm also grateful that my Savior knows what suffering is like um, and how to, how to balance suffering with joy. That's awesome. You know, we can for sure tell that you have a very strong testimony of your Savior. Um, where, if, if we might ask, where and how did you find your testimony of Jesus Christ? I, I found it through, uh, um, you know, there's that old saying of nobody understands why they need Christ and, until they understand that they're fallen. Uh, you know, you have to realize you're drowning before you want to be saved. And uh, uh, there's, that's part of the reason why you and I suffer in life. It's part of the reason why you and I make mistakes and feel pain is so that then we can realize that we need help. And I, I have come to know my Savior in my, uh, in, in my extremities. Frankly, elders, I really started to come to know him when I was wearing a suit and a name badge just like you. Uh, I, I served my mission in Bolivia, which is in South America. I served in the top of the Andes Mountains. My first area was 14,000 feet of elevation. I lived in a mud house with a tin roof, and I was suffering. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it caused me to reach out, and it, it, it caused me to really start to get to know my Savior. So... With that greater suffering came a greater knowledge of him. Yeah, definitely. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say sin too. Just anybody who's hung around with me, they'd be like, oh yeah, I'm, that guy's made a lot of mistakes too. So 
<laughs> I've also really come to know my Savior in uh, in my belief that He can uh, cleanse us of our mistakes that we make, and I'm so grateful that He's helped me and it continues to help me in my weaknesses and shortcomings. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, there's a, there's a lot of questions coming in about how um, you know, you're taking off, I guess, kind of with your painting aspect and we you always planning on being a painter. Have you painted since you were a kid? What's your background yeah. as a painter? So I always paint. I mean, that's what got me through church when I was a kid was I would sit there and draw the speaker <laughs> and they were like, oh, man, that sweat kid, he listens so good. No, I was just drawing pictures of, <laughs> of the speaker. I've always drawn. I've always been creative. I've always liked to, to paint. I painted in high school, um, and that's what when I, when I went to go to college, I was like, well, what do I love? I love art. So I majored in fine art and painting and drawing. And then my original plans were to be a full-time painter. Um, and then uh, I, I like to joke that God, he saved me from a life of poverty. <laughs> uh, and instead he led me into the big money of religious education. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, and what's interesting is I always wanted to use my painting religiously to help people experience and understand God better and the gospel and the restoration. So it's been fun to incorporate my art as a professor, a, a religion professor as well of, of, of our church's history and doctrine. So yeah, I've done it my whole life. That's awesome. Do you have kind of influenced you, a painter that has influenced you or anything like that? Oh yeah, my my first apostles were painters. Um, I, I knew names like Harry Anderson and uh, um, you know, uh, DCA Christensen and uh, Tom Lovell. And I knew these artists and illustrators who painted religious scenes. I knew them before I knew names like, you know, uh, uh, Marvin J. Ashton or, or like all those early painters that would be in our church's magazines and that painted the life of Christ and the restoration and they, they influenced me a lot, and I look up to them a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, um, as far as you know, life experience, you know, you you under your belt by now. Not too much, not too much. But <laughs> what's the greatest life advice that you've received? In general. In general, it's a very it's a broad question. Oh man, that's a broad question. I want to know? People want to know. <laughs> Best best life advice I've got is, uh, well, I'll give you two. One of them, when my wife and I uh, got married, the sealer said, or the, guy, the person who married us said, what are the three most important words you can say to your wife every day to have a happy marriage? And I said, uh, I love you. And he said, well, I, I love you too, but that, those aren't the three most important words. He said, the three most important words to say are, you're probably right. He said, just say that every day and you'll be happy. <laughs> and a few years into our, my wife and I've been married for 23 years now. And a few years into our marriage, my wife said, "It's just, it's just two words. Just say you're right. Just say you're right." <laughs> <laughs> That's one. I'll give you one more. I'll give you one that my wife says all the time. My my sweatheart, as I like to call her, uh, Sister Sweat. <laughs> she likes to say to our kids, uh, "People are more important than things." Um. That's a good one. People are more important than things. And then another one that uh, we all, we kind of like to live by too is, in all your dealings, make friends in heaven. And I, I like that too. And, and in all my dealings with people, I, wanna, I want them to look at me in heaven and consider me a friend. I want to make friends in heaven, not make enemies. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. We have, we're noticing in the background and people are commenting about the guitars. Yeah. Are you also a musician by chance? <laughs> no, those are, no, let's see, I got to go this way. It's like driving in reverse. Um, uh, those are, uh, those are my kids' guitars and ukuleles. They're, they're the musical ones, not me. Oh, you got, you got one side of the arts. They have the other. 
Exactly. That that right there, though, that's a painting that I did of my uh, fourth great grandmother and grandfather, John and Polly Sweat, who joined the church, uh, settled in Nauvoo, came west, and both of them died on the plains and were buried in a hollowed out log. So that's our little, that's our sweat uh, connection to church history right there. So, wow. Yeah, I'll do the I'll do the paintings and I'll let my kids do the music. <laughs> That's awesome. I we're gonna take a look at some of the other questions we have here. <laughs> um yeah, there's a question here. Um and then you, you started talking about how you walk in the light of Jesus Christ and kind of feeling his, his presence in your life. So how do you personally feel the spirit? the most in your life when you feel like you you're closest to Jesus Christ? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I have to think about that. I don't know if it's a particular thing. Like, I mean, you could give the Sunday school answers of when I'm studying the scriptures, but frankly, sometimes I study the scriptures and, and I'm bored. Uh, it's just like that. <laughs> if that hasn't happened to you, then you're not being real. Uh, I could say, but I, I definitely do feel his presence strongly sometimes in reading scripture. And I definitely feel his presence strongly sometimes when I pray. But then other, other times my prayers are pretty lame, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, I feel his presence really strongly in church. And uh Sometimes I feel the presence of the adversary very strongly in church because I'm just angry and bored or whatever. But, uh, you know, so I don't know. I think there's 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 different things. The job that we have to do is to look for divine things every day. Sometimes I really feel his presence in, in just being around other people. Uh, sometimes I really feel his presence in art or in music, or in film. Uh, sometimes I feel his presence in nature, sometimes. So to me, the trick is uh, to seek him on a daily basis uh, and and let him speak to you in different methods, in different ways. Yeah, I think that's really cool. You, you added such a broad list, and I think that goes to show the character of Christ. If you said, like, in the end, that if we seek him, we can find him. Um, yeah, different, unique, personal ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And somebody out there who's maybe more hard science minded than I am, they, they might seek him and feel him in a microscope. Um, so, so yeah, but I really see him in, in, in a lot of ways and, and feel him in a lot of ways. That's awesome. The, the gospel is something very personal. And because of that, it's, we all have different ways that we can come closer to him, that we can feel him in our lives. And yeah. Something really special. That's awesome. We have a lot of people are commenting about your hair. <laughs> <laughs> How what do, they, what do they want to know about my hair? <laughs> How are you able to keep such beautiful hair? <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm going to have to quote you on that one. Well, I've let it grow kind of long during uh, quarantine. During quarantine, man. I mean, look at that. Whoa. <laughs> so my hair is normally not this long. It's been summer in quarantine. And I've said, I'm just not going to cut it and, and get the get the curlies in the back. But yeah, oh, yeah. I figure, you know, I have my whole life to have short hair. I might as well let it grow long right now. But the bad, the bad thing about having longer hair is it shows all my gray hairs too. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Elder. You you got you got Elder Sims. You got some pretty good hair too, brother. Oh, I'm yeah, flattered. Go, Elder, Sims. <laughs> oh, Elder Gardner, look at your flow too. I mean, you guys, you guys could be talking. Yeah. I, at one point, I had hair it was probably down to my shoulders, and then you know the mission came, but. <laughs> <laughs> We're just hoping that we are able to keep our hair like you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't. There, there's no control over that, brother. Um. Well, <laughs> we 
we have <laughs> comments going in. What kind of shampoo do you use? <laughs> Ir irrelevant. Whatever my wife buys. <laughs> Speaking of your wife, uh, what? How many kids do you have? Tell us a little bit about your family. So we have seven kids, and uh, probably uh, to somebody in Boston or Rhode Island, that sounds insane. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, but listen, uh, and there's, everybody's in different situations. I totally understand that. Uh, but, um, and I love that our church has been much more clear on saying when you have kids, there's a lot of factors involved. Um, that's between you, your wife and the Lord. And my wife and I have just been fortunate that we've been able to be able to have seven kids. Uh, so we, we consider that a huge blessing and it's been a huge blessing in our life. So our oldest is 21 and married. And then I have a daughter on a mission right now. Awesome. I have another one in high, two that are going into high school, one in junior high, one in grade school, and we have a little four year old at home. So we're running a big. <laughs> That's a, a 17 year gap there. Yeah. We got a 17 year gap and whatever context you're in, I have a kid in that rough age. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> That's awesome. What kind of what kind of things do you guys enjoy doing as a family? Oh, um, you know we're we're a big uh, we like basketball because basketball is the game of the gods. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the the church is true, and in the middle of every church is a basketball court, not not a baseball diamond. So let's just make sure that's clear. Uh, uh, we like to play basketball. And we uh, we like outdoor stuff too. My wife likes to take us hiking, so that's awesome. Bringing the little four year old along with you. You got the hiking twenty one year old, then you got the four year old that's bringing up the bag. <laughs> you better, better believe it. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, um, we're kind of wrapping up here, but I guess as a final question, um, you know we ask you the best advice that you've ever received. So what's the, the best advice that you could tell us? Tell you as missionaries or tell anybody out there as a listener? Everyone. Something that can apply to everyone. What is your message to the world? <laughs> That's so much pressure, Elder. <laughs> Man, alive. Uh, <laughs> no, my, I, I would say, um, just one last thought is that Christ, uh, he really is the way. That's not just not just lip service. And uh, I really believe that his way is the way. And so I would just invite all of us to seek him out um, and uh, try our very best to hear him, try our very best to follow him and to know him. And I have no doubt that uh, he will guide you right if you and I will be willing to put aside our pride, our own desires, our own will, our own, uh, our own agendas, uh, and listen, listen to him. And I'm confident that his work is going forward on this earth and that one day the kingdom of God will be, uh, his will will be perfectly done on this earth and his kingdom will be established. So just everybody do, that, do what they can to help the Lord's will, to know his will, to follow his will and establish his will. Maybe, maybe I'll say it that way. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Very profound. Um, I guess one, one last thing we have for you. Uh, we have non-members are also watching this and specifically to non-members, our friends, what would you like to say to them? Uh, I would like to say that I love you. I love you as a brother in the gospel. And uh, I hope I can, if you ever cross paths, I hope we can talk and chat. And whether you do or don't ever become a member of our faith, uh, we believe that uh, God loves all of his children, works with all of his children. Uh, that God is at work across this earth with a lot of different faiths and a lot of different people and a lot of different institutions. Uh, we do believe that our church has 
what we call priesthood or the authority of God to administer ordinances of exaltation. And I would invite you to learn about those and uh, um, how we have the authority to administer the, the covenants of exaltation and what that means. But, but whether you do or don't, uh, it doesn't minimize my love or God's love. Uh, I love you. He loves you. And I'm confident he's working with you. And just God bless you as you seek him out uh, in your own respective faiths and, and fields and, and your own ways. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Brother Sweat. We are so happy that we have you here on tonight uh, for this devotional. And thank you for the message that you shared and for answering our questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a joy to be with you. Thank you, elders and sisters, for putting this together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to transition over to a closing musical number that will be provided by Elder Shearer and Elder Ren Gifo, who are elders serving in the Massachusetts Boston Mission, and we'll have a closing prayer by Elder Chu, which will be in Chinese. <laughs>天父我们非常感谢您赐给我们今天这个非常美好的晚会我们可以大家听到安德尼弟兄跟我们分享的他的感想还有他为我们提供的很好的建议还有他的观点来帮助我们可以知道我们可以怎样更好的跟随基督还
Christ and how we as as Jesus Christ brothers and sisters can come unto him. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and we'll see you again on Walk in the Light in two weeks. If you guys do have any questions, feel free to message this page at any time. We are always here to answer them. And if uh, we, we just love to hear from you guys. Any thoughts that you have, any questions that you have, we're here. Thanks again, brothers. Have a nice day. Have a good you, night, everybody. Love you.